Many conservationists would like to say that one of the goals motivating their conservation is the protection of biodiversity for the life form's own sake, and not only for the sake of humans who enjoy the, physical, the visual spectacle of a world teeming with a variety of life forms. Such a justification for biodiversity protection would not necessarily supplant any anthropocentric arguments in favor of conservation, but could supplement these arguments, potentially making the overall case for biodiversity conservation stronger. However, a plausible and non-self-defeating defense of preserving biodiversity for its own sake has been elusive. In this talk, I will suggest a method of valuing certain sentient animal species that may avoid some of the problems of previous, previous attempts to ascribe value to nature. Although it too stops short of valuing biodiversity for its own sake, it ar arguably gets us somewhat closer without undermining conservation goals. My suggestion would be to recognize the value of experiential variety generalized at a species level. It's based on the assumption that many different species of animals have a characteristic sort of perception and experience of the world, which is shared to a large extent within species, but not as much across species, and that the variety of internal states associated with different species can be worthy of protection. I'll start off by claiming that it would be a failure of environmentalism if it, if it did not take any account of animals' interstates when considering biodiversity conservation. And I will summarize why others have seen this as a difficult challenge. Following that, I will look at potential perils with using welfareist or animal rights approaches as an alternative to sentient and different biodiversity conservation. I will then propose experiential diversity as a way of supplementing more standard biodiversity conservation arguments. I'll conclude by responding to objections to using experiential diversity as a criterion in biodiversity preservation. Zahotra Sarkar proposed six adequacy conditions for a conservation ethic. The three most relevant for my purposes are a collectivity condition, a priority setting condition, and a non-anthropocentrism condition. The collectivity condition is, he quote, in particular, the ethic must attribute value at least to species and ipso, faps, ipso facto to populations, because in practice, these are the entities that are most often going to be the direct targets of conservation. The important point here is that attributing this value to species must not be entirely based on attributing values to individual organisms. The priority setting condition is, he says, the ethic must allow, if not provide a method for, the prioritization of species or other targets in conservation contexts. In particular, threatened or rare species, communities, and other higher level entities should score higher than common ones. Note that without this condition, we would have no justification for many of our standard conservationist practices, including our focus on endangered species. And the non-anthropocentrism condition, preferably the ethics should allow us to attribute value to biological entities without reference to our most parochial human interests. So without a non-anthropocentric condition, biodiversity conservation can look contradictory in that it's often concerned with protecting non-human animal lives, but can't muster any sort of interest in the interstates involved with those lives. But the non-anthropocentric condition is thought to be a tricky fit with the collectivity and priority setting conditions. And since conservation is difficult without those two, it's tempting for conservationists to just ignore non-anthropocentrism. Bernard Jemek helped set an aesthetic-centric tone for the preservation of certain animal lives through his 1959 documentary, The Serengeti Shall Not Die. Although Jemek was concerned with migration patterns and the awe-inspiring sight of animals gathered in certain locales, rather than with biodiversity. As a narrator, he describes the noble mission of conserving animals, contrasting it with the base local human interest in exploiting the land that these animals temporarily occupy throughout the year. He, he says in his narration, these last remaining herds of African game are a cultural heritage of all mankind, just like our cathedrals and ancient monuments, the Acropolis, St. Peter's, and the Louvre in Paris. No man, black or white, should ever be allowed to endanger the future of these last living cultural treasures of Africa. Jamek's soaring rhetoric about the preservation of these creatures clashes awkwardly with this simultaneous objectification of them. As he critiques black Africans, whose survival partially depended on the use of this land for disrespecting animals, he seems oddly concerned with the interstates of the non-human lives he wants to protect. So if we admit that it's only aesthetics or other obviously anthropocentric values that motivate bio biodiversity conservation, this is not necessarily a problem. But this living art framing of sentient biodiversity fails to capture a sense in which some conservationists do seem to value sentient wildlife. Unless we deny that animals have experiences, it seems disingenuous to claim to want to value animals for their own sakes without placing any value whatsoever on the experiences the animals have. Sarkar writes that a typical attempt to satisfy the condition that, quote, the conservation ethic should allow us to attribute value to biological entities without reference to our most parochial human interests is to argue that species have intrinsic value. 
Sarkar distinguishes two main definitions of intrinsic value, but is most salient for my purposes here, contrasts it with instrumentalism. He writes, whatever value an entity has is irrespective of whatever value it may have as a means to the end of any other entity, typically humans in the context of biodiversity conservation. How intrinsic value may be applied to nature, if at all, has been debated for decades. In the mid-1980s, Baird Callicott gave up on the idea of nature having mind independent intrinsic value. And since then, environmental philosophers have mostly seemed reluctant to say that nature has value whether or not anyone values it. Nevertheless, we can value nature without commodifying it, and we might call this a kind of intrinsic valuation. One move environmental philosophers might make is to say that we ascribe intrinsic value to nature, and this is why we should protect it. As stated so far, though, this sort of intrinsic valuing may be too generic, because it doesn't distinguish between non-sentient nature and sentient nature. This would place no special value on concern for animals' internal states. To, rec to correct this, we could say animals have a special value because they have sentience and care about how their lives go. However, this line of thinking typically pushes us toward an animal rights or welfare framework that seeks to protect animals from pain and death. That may be exactly where a lot of us want to go, but it's potentially unappealing to environmental philosophers who are less concerned with protecting individual animals than they are with protecting species. Elliot Sober describes the major dispute between environmentalists and animal liberationists as a skirmish over holism versus individualism, respectively. Environmentalists value the preservation of species, communities, or ecosystems, whereas animal advocates value the individual organisms that compose these. Since species do not experience pleasure and pain in other inner states, only the members of a particular sentient species do, granting intrinsic value to all life forms with sentience would undermine environmentalism's holistic mission, potentially. If non-human animals are owed protections based on their interests and not suffering or dying, it becomes difficult to unjustify calling certain animals to protect certain species, for instance. For instance, There is no reason to think endangered species are in general more sentient than non-endangered species. Once we take the internal states of individual animals into account like this, it seems we can no longer treat the animals as mere means, and treating animals as mere means is sometimes necessary in the quest to preserve biodiversity. For sober, this shows that biodiversity advocacy may have more in common with aesthetics than with ethics. He writes, Environment, environmentalism and aesthetics both see value in rarity. Of two whales, why should one be more worthy of aid than another, just because one belongs to an endangered species? As an ethical concern, rarity is difficult to understand. But viewed as valuable aesthetic objects, rare organisms may be valuable because they are rare. One solution to this conflict between environmental ethics and animal ethics could be just to forget about the, um, the collectivity conditions and the um, priority setting conditions and instead just focus on the non-anthropocentric condition. Um, but this has problems of its own and I'll explore some problems with that now. But before turning to wild animals, it will help to consider rights and welfare solutions to domesticated farm animal suffering. Typically, these rely on preventative beneficence, that is, preventing the creation of lives that will not be worth living. There are two major concerns that motivate preventative beneficence in the context of animal farming, what I will call the circumstances concern and the physiology concern. Because these animals mostly exist in the brutal system of factory agriculture, we know that if they were born, they would suffer a lot before being killed at a young age. That's the circumstances concern. The physiology concern is that the genetics of domesticated animals makes it difficult for these animals to survive independently of us, so their genes more or less doom them to undesirable lives if we decided to liberate them. The typical vision of how the rights or welfare approaches play out in this context is that we all stop eating animal products. Farmers no longer have a reason to breed animals for food, and the animals who have not been killed are put into sanctuaries where they live out their lives. At that point, it gets a little more fuzzy, but many and maybe most of the animals on sanctuaries would be prohibited from reproducing. This could be done through contraception or through segregation of the sexes, but <coughs> unless we think non-human animals have a desire or right to have children, we could orchestrate their extinctions or near extinctions without violating their rights. And of course, once they cease to exist, it becomes impossible to violate their rights. Antinatalism is not an obvious solution to conflicts between us and wild animals, since they generally exist despite us rather than because of us. But giving rights to animals who will continue to exist once they have these rights poses a new set of difficulties poses a new set of difficulties. If we respected wild animal rights, we would not hunt them for food. But um, their rights would presumably go beyond this. How far they would go beyond this is more controversial. 
But if rights are meant to protect their interests, some of these might be a right to their habitats, a right to protection from reckless endangerment of their lives. And this sounds good from an environmental perspective because development, pollution, <coughs> and climate change could count as infringements upon habitat and reckless endangerment, endangerment of animal lives. But depending on the rights we think that animals have, this could go too far for environmentalists who are not committed to deep ecology. Rights views often conceptualize animals as moral patients who have rights against us, but no obligations to us or others. Currently, we're used to moral patients being at some man manageable number that we more or less control, with babies and children being the primary examples of these. But once we extend moral patienthood to animals who are everywhere and who we have no connection to, we would potentially be vi violating their rights all the time, while, that they, while they, by definition, could never wrong us. This could create an asymmetry that would lead to some major problems if we did not water down what we meant by rights. We would not necessarily have a right against animals that allows us to harm them through any form of development, keeping them out of our homes, building roads, killing them with our roads, installing wind turbines that kill them, killing them to protect our crops, or harming them through pollution and global warming. These are all activities that can harm humans too, but often the humans who are harmed were at least getting something out of these activities, and if they weren't, we usually consider them to be especially wronged, and often we consider them to be wrong, even if they were getting something out of these activities. Animals are generally not getting anything out of these, and this could put us in a state of near constant rights violation in regards to them. If our theory of rights suggests that we ought to mitigate our rights violations as much as we can, some form of antinatalism might start to look tempting again. In the case of domesticated animals, we avoided, we avoided violating their rights through their extinction. In the case of wild animals, we might think we need to avoid violating their rights through our own extinction. After all, we would not violate our own rights by voluntarily ceasing to procreate. Another possibility, though it's difficult to imagine this ever being practical, is that we could orchestrate the extinction of wild animals through contraception. This would be a rights-friendly way of avoiding the intractable rights conflict between humans and non-human animals. Obviously, this would be at odds with biodiversity preservation. Animal, welfare, animal welfareism also looks to clash with biodiversity preservation, and again, this is not only because it prevents us from killing common animals to protect rare animals. Consider again the physiology and circumstances concerns that help to motivate extinction or near extinction of farm animals. Some animal advocates now point out the circumstances facing wild animals are anarchy and disorder. Food is frequently scarce, fear and injuries are common, death tends to be early and often painful, weather events and natural disasters violently disrupt lives, and diseases, diseases and parasites are rampant. This picture may be exaggerated, but the idea is that the state of nature is not only bad for humans. The animal welf these animal welfareists think the physiology concern applies as well, and that wild animals are not intelligent enough to devise sophisticated long-term solutions to these circumstances. In this respect, wild animals and domesticated animals are different only in degree. Wild animals are better at thriving on their own than domesticated animals are, but still not as adept as human societies are. Sentience is a dangerous gift that perhaps no non-human animals are in a position to master, this welfareism implies. And there's a limit to how much we can help non-humans to avoid the dark side of sensation. Various interventions on behalf of wild animals have been proposed, but it seems likely these will meet with only limited success given that the wild animal population is so large and many of the individual animals are small, afraid of humans, and difficult to reach and treat. If our primary solution to the problems of animal suffering is to prevent subpar lives from coming into existence, a welfareist model might encourage us to extend the antinatalist solution for farm animals to wild animals as well. And this would obviously be bad for biodiversity conservation. I'm not saying that issues like this are irresolvable within an animal rights or welfareist framework. But, there are some but these are some concerns that environmentalists and others may have beyond that animal welfareism or rights causes problems for the collectivity and priority conditions. Those who are interested in preserving biodiversity will probably want to avoid strong rights or welfare approaches if they think they can. But this does not mean that Elliot Sober is correct that biodiversity advocates do not have much to say about animals in our states. One, select, one suggested solution is to value the sentience of animals contingently as just one method of valuing animals and one that may lose out to competing valuations. Alan Randall describes intrinsic existence value and he says, and he called, he describes this by saying, in which the individual human cares about the well-being of non-human components of the ecosystem. And he writes that it's consistent with treating animals as a resource, quote, caring is extended to non-human animals because it gives the human satisfaction to do so. Such caring may, of course, be limited and selective. And since it is extended unilaterally, it may similarly be withdrawn. The recognition of intrinsic altruism in no way endorses concepts such as species rights. 
So just like in animals, having interesting coloration is something that we can value without automatically conferring rights upon the animal. We could treat the sentience of non-human animals as something to be valued without thinking it necessarily confers rights. This may be helpful or may not, but I, th I think it's possible to do more to link valuation of animals interstates with biodiversity preservation goals. We can do this by combining Randall's contingently valuing animal sentience idea with a more specific valuing of the contribution that species make to the experiential variety in the world. Valuing experiential variety assumes there, there's something it is like to be non-human animals, and this something is distinct in varying degrees from species to species. This presumed distinctness arises because the genetic and phenotypical differences in species. It feels different to fly and live much of your life in the air than it does to swim and then live much of your life in the water, a way in which it is different to be a bird rather than a fish. And the differences can be more fine-grained than that. It is different to be a hawk than a vulture and to be a dolphin rather than a whale. Mode of locomotion, physical size, bodily structure, such as being a vertebrate or invertebrate, typical habitat, and brain size and neural organization and density vary between species. We can see these traits manifesting as differences in behavior and appearance, but these should also lead to differences in what it is like to be a member of a particular species. Qualitative differences exist at the individual level too, of course, but these differences are perhaps most significant and more neurologically complicated species such as humans. An advocate of experiential variety could say it is different to be a beetle than it is to be a flying squirrel. And so by preserving beetles and flying squirrels, we increase the diversity of experiences in the world. The gastric brooding frog, when it existed, swallowed its fertilized eggs and stopped eating for six weeks until offspring emerged from its mouth. When a species like that goes extinct, we potentially lose the aesthetic experience of witnessing or interacting with a species that is visually or conceptually intriguing in some way. But there's another loss, arguably, in that the species' own distinct way of experiencing the world disappears too. Why we should value experiential variety is difficult to answer directly. It may be a bit like asking why value beauty, and I have no idea. There might be an answer to that, but I wouldn't know where to start. It could be that we either value experiential variety or we do not, but I can at least describe some desirable implications of valuing it. In the context of biodiversity preservation, valuing experiential variety allows us to take an interest in the interstates of animals without losing sight of species because the internal experiences we would be interested in protecting can be generalized at the species level. It would be acceptable for individual members of the species to die, so long as the species itself survives and the experience of being a member of that species continues. We could consider members of animal species to be carriers of the distinctive or otherwise valuable experience of being a member of that species. Particular species can still be prioritized for uniqueness or rarity because not all sentient animals will qualify as carriers of rare species experiences. If an invasive species expands at the expense of a threatened species, it not only harms our aesthetic experience, it potentially reduces the variety of experience types in the world and increases experiential uniformity. It might be justifiable to kill these variety reducing animals to protect the endangered animal experience. We may justify biodiversity preservation without reference to animals in our states, but when we do so, we ignore an essential component of the beings we seek to protect. Thinking about experiential variety potentially increases our imaginative capacity and empathy by encouraging us to imagine what it is like to be another sort of being. It reminds us, or at least those of us who need reminding, that animals are experiencing beings and not just eye candy. This puts us in a better position to care about species and to take their inner states into account without requiring that we protect every individual. So I'll consider some objections now. Valuing experiential variety does not avoid anthropocentrism. When we value the variety of inner states that species represent, we value something that members of the species cannot themselves value. The distinctness of their experiences compared with that of other species. Gastric brooding frogs had no idea there was anything unique about swallowing their fertilized eggs and fasting until offspring emerge from your mouth. It is only humans who value the oddity of the gastric brooding frog experience. Therefore, valuing experiential variety does not avoid anthropocentrism. I think this is probably right, but the objection overlooks what the valuing of experiential variety does achieve by giving some importance to animals in our states. It is true that we are valuing these inner states from human perspectives for reasons the animals having these experiences do not share, but this may be an, an inevitable consequence of our inability to fully transcend our own perspectives. Sarkar writes, appreciation of or even reverence for non-human living forms still has a human referent, the individual who does the appreciating or revering. The valuing of experiential variety provides another way to bring the experiences of animals into conservation debates, even if it is still human values determining our priorities. 
we simply do not value experiential variety. This is another possible objection. If I cannot make experiential variety seem important to those who are not already disposed to caring about it, an obvious question is whether any of us do value it. Jonathan Dancy commented that if there were a five-legged animal that was the last of its kind, we would want to protect this animal because it's a bizarre and rare creature. We would not be thinking about what it's like to be this animal. Possibly, but I'm not sure we're also utterly and consistently indifferent to the inner states of animals, to the point that it never matters to us whether they experience anything at all. Would we feel differently about biodiversity conservation if it turned out non-human animals had no experience whatsoever? For some, the answer may be no, because they really just care about looking at the animals. But, um, and I agree for them, experiential diversity is irrelevant to biodiversity conservation. Still, I think those who ignore the interstates of animals do not fully appreciate everything that's in stake in sentient biodiversity preservation. Furthermore, there clearly are people interested in what it is like to be a member of another species. Veterinarian Charles Foster is an example. His fascination with the inner lives of animals began in childhood when he looked into a blackbird's eyes and wanted to know what the bird knew. In his book, Being a Beast, Foster writes about how his fascination drove him to live like other animals. He lived in a tunnel, blindfolded himself, navigated by scent, and ate earthworms to try to get a, get a sense of what it was like to be a badger. To a large extent, this may have been a stunt, but I assume there was some sincerity in this. And while Foster may be unusual in the extent of his fascination, I doubt he is all that unusual in wondering what it is like to be other animals and in seeing value in the existence of a very, a very distinct ways of experiencing the world. A test of whether we do sp specifically care about experiential variety is to imagine a harmless but boring looking beetle that frequently exists in a state of vivid hallucination. Say we know this because we mapped the chemical makeup of this beetle and its main food source and realized the interactions of the two created hallucinatory experiences, distinct beetle hallucinations. This beetle has a decent quality of life, let us say, but its hallucinations do not correspond with sensations of intense bliss. Furthermore, we already have the scientific knowledge that the continued existence of this beetle would offer us. Does knowing that this beetle frequently enters fantastical altered states give us a reason to value this species of beetle despite our aesthetic and scientific indifference to it? Those who say yes presumably value experiential variety or structure of experience and not just quality of experience and the scientific or aesthetic value of species. But I acknowledge that some people might still see no reason to preserve this beetle, and I, there's not much more I could say to them. Another objection is that experiential variety ignores the quality of the experiences for species. Even if we do not turn our attention to animals, even if we do turn our attention to animals and our states, it may not be experiential variety that seems like the greatest concern. Jean Cazes imagines a species that she calls pangfish, which have headaches like ours and no other mental life. By existing in a state of constant migraine while swimming, the species would contribute to experiential variety, and yet the pangfish themselves would be subjected to constant misery. This shows experiential variety is not always a good thing, since variety can manifest in negative forms. If we take the inner states of non-humans into account, this, the objection is that we should care about quality of experiences rather than uniqueness. Certainly this would be less anthropocentric. The pleasure an animal has is something it can enjoy, while the rarity of its, of its experience is not. The animals we should want to preserve then, according to this objection, are those who most enjoy life. If we think flying squirrels are the most fun animals to be, we should preserve that species most fervently. If we discover pangfish, we should hasten their extinction. It, seem, it definitely seems right that uniqueness, whether of experience or external appearance and behavior, cannot be all that we value. And I'm, I'm not saying that we should be maximizing experiential variety here. Sarkar writes, peculiar behaviors may well be pathological, something to be avoided at all costs, rather than carefully preserved and nurtured. We are happy that serial murderers are rare. We would not bemoan their extinction. However, if we do not care about experiential variety at all, and care only about the quality of experience, we might settle on a, we might settle on a single species as the most all-around enjoyable species to be, and focus all conservation <coughs> resources on that. I would call this mental monocropping. It would have us increase the existence of mind types that are more prone to good mental sensations, and less prone to bad ones, and decrease the existence of mind types that are more prone to bad mental sensations and less prone to good ones. Peter Singer once suggested the happiest world may be a planet of only sheep, and that someone who cares only about the quality of mental states should try to ensure that almost all animals are sheep. A flying squirrel planet also sounds promising. But given the concerns being raised about wild animal suffering, it may be that humans have the most promising mind type. Whatever you, may, whatever you think of, Whatever you think of it, John Stuart Mill's argument about higher and lower pleasures is suggestive here. 
If it is better to be human dissatisfied than a pig satisfied, which is admittedly a doubtable premise, then it is better for human lives to supplant pig lives. This is related to the stance some philosophers take that when there is a conflict between extending the life of a human and extending the life of a non-human animal, it can be better to extend the human life because the relative complexity of human minds means humans get more out of life and so have more to lose at death. If, if existing humans have more to lose at death than non-human animals do, then there's more to gain by being a human than by being a non-human animal. And so again, it is better for humans to be born than for non-human animals to be born. This line of argument raises population ethics questions that I'm not going to address here. Um, but maybe it'll come up in the discussion. One counter argument is that the simplicity of animal minds makes those lives generally better than ours when the animals are fortunate enough to exist in good conditions. By living more in the present, animals' feelings may be more intense than our own, which are diluted with encroachments from the past and hypothetical futures. Perhaps then we should want there to be far fewer humans and far more non-human animals. I say fewer humans instead of zero because left on their own, non-human animals would be powerless to fight against a deadly contagious virus, for instance. In a scenario where we try to maximize quality of experiences, humans could act as benevolent helpers to animals, developing medicines for them and treating their illnesses and injuries, editing their genes, protecting them from viruses, natural disasters, and from each other. Unfortunately, a world of mostly animals puts plus some helper humans seems to run into the old problem that it's impossible for humans to take care of all the animals who could benefit from our careful interventions. While the simplicity of animal minds possibly provides the advantage of more intense feelings of joy, this joy is arguably unsustainable because you need sophistication and complexity to better navigate the world's dangers. When we compare the upsides and downsides of simple minds and complex minds, complex minds appear to win out in the end. This will be more obvious if welfare boosting technologies continue to improve since these could help us to more effectively overcome the downsides of our mental complexity. Mental monocropping thus seems to lead to something like a mostly human planet with perhaps some well-treated non-human companion animals. Those who balk at this vision may value more than quality of experience. Maybe they value experiential variety. Conservationists who value uniqueness of experience need not value only that. If we approach conservation with a plurality of values in mind, and then discover that a particular species of animal has a steady and painful headache from birth to death, or is otherwise doomed by its genetics to frequent or constant misery, this would provide a compelling reason to, to not preserve that species of animal, even if we valued it for aesthetic, educational, ecological, or resource purposes. If it seems a particular species of animal experiences a lot of pleasure, we might want to favor that one in many cases. Sometimes, however, we might prioritize a species with a general conscious experience that acts as an unusual window into the world, even if this experience is not accompanied by a constant state of bliss. For those who do not want to transform into a world of only sheep, only humans, or only flying squirrels, valuing the uniqueness of experience allows us to appreciate animals' inner experiences without hedonic calculations overwhelming all of their considerations, acting as a safeguard against mental monocropping. The last objection that I'll discuss here is valuing experiential variety threatens the protection of non-sentient biodiversity. This objection goes that Mountains, plants, and other forms of non-sentient biodiversity do not experience any, anything. And so valuing experiential variety could lead to the sacrificing of non-experiential nature for experiential nature. And this is, this is a, obviously a stronger concern for the environmental philosophers than the animal ethicists. My first response is that non-human animals having internal states does give us a reason to try to preserve them that we do not have for plants, mountains, and other forms of non-sentient nature. To deny this would apparently require placing zero value on non-human qualia but do we really not see any significant difference between the protection of rare sentient animals and rare plants when we value the aesthetics and educational contributions of both equally? Most of, most of us acknowledge there is something valuable about having an experience of the world when we attempt to extend our own lives. Would we not care more about preserving mountains if we knew that mountains had experiences? But having more reasons to protect sentient biodiversity does not itself mean that non-sentient biodiversity gets ignored. If we believe we have a special obligation to take care of our children because we brought them into the world, and they especially need our help. This does not mean we no longer can justify taking care of people or things we did not bring into the world. We can acknowledge special reasons for protecting certain aspects of the world without rejecting the rest of it. Second, major conflicts between protecting sentient and non-sentient nature are unlikely to arise when we place a lot of value on experiential variety. In fact, valuing experiential variety should strengthen our commitment to protecting, protecting diverse non-sentient nature. This is because protecting non-sentient biodiversity does increase experiential diversity, even if this increase is indirect rather than direct. When we have a greater variety of landscapes to look at, 
to live in and to explore, the diversity of our experiences is increased. And admittedly, this is blurring it with aesthetics, but I think there's some sort of difference here. Um, so this is true, too, for other sentient animals. Though we assume mountains and trees do not contribute to experiential diversity through having their own experiential states, they do add to the experiential diversity of those who do have inner states. If the world were a giant white box that was empty save for a variety of sentient creatures, experiential diversity between species would flatten. Flying through a blank backdrop as a bird and walking through a blank backdrop as a human is not as experientially disparate as flying over a varied world as a bird and walking through a varied world as a human. Along with functioning as awe-inspiring backdrops, non-sentient nature serves as homes and sustenance to sentient creatures, helping make their lives possible. Non-sentient biodiversity is an important building block of diverse experiences. Valuing experiential diversity might make us think differently about why we preserve non-sentient biodiversity, but it would not make us preserve it any less. And we could also preserve things for aesthetic reasons as well. It's just it, it, Valuing experiential diversity, does, I'm, I'm not imagining that, um, overriding all their valuations. The valuing of, of experiential variety offers a species-centered way to value the inner states of sentient animals we wish to protect. It need not be decisive in debates over which forms of life are worth protecting, and it does not offer an escape from anthropocentrism. However, the valuing of experiential variety does help to address a prevalent oddity about biodiversity conservation. The conservationists frequently appear to place no value on the mental states of the animal species they hope to preserve. By appreciating that our world is being viewed, felt, and navigated in a wide variety of ways, biodiversity discourse can recognize the importance of non-humans' mental states without undermining the species' prioritizing goals of environmental conservation, and while avoiding the extremes of a strong animal rights or welfarist position. I, 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 could, I could end here, or I could do, I have more objections if I have more time. <laughs> um, but I'll, I guess I'll conclude there, unless. Yeah, thanks for this fascinating talk. <laughs> My goodness, um, so many questions. So please let your hands up for a while so I can. Can we just start, start here and then I go around? Okay, sure. uh, um, why isn't the uh, valuing experiential variety uh, an aesthetic value? Uh, and for me, aesthetic valuing is anthropocentric and this is a problem that's really important, so I'm not trying to dismiss what you're doing by, that, by arguing that, but I don't see why it isn't, I mean, it's a kind of rarity, and so why, why isn't there at least a strong aesthetic element to that? So it's a kind of aesthetic value you put on it, rather than, well, I don't know, I mean, you think of it as an ethical value that you're promoting? No, I, I, it, I think you're right, it's, but I, I, it's definitely in the aesthetic realm. Um, but one objection someone brought to that, and the reason I didn't, uh, originally I said something like, we can, it's almost an aesthetic valuation of these other animals' experiences, but then this raises the question whether animals themselves can have an aesthetic experience. I don't quite understand how to answer that. But I, I think you're right that it's not that different from aesthetics. It, in some sense, it's valuing the internal, internal aesthetics as opposed to external. Um, yeah, so. I, and, and we're not experiencing it. Uh, no. Like, so, you know, a lot of times people think for an aesthetic experience, you have to have the object, you have to experience it, but we're not ex Right. It's, it's more of a, yeah, it's more of an imaginative aesthetic experience. And just knowing that there's these other sorts of experiences out there, but not experiencing them directly. And, yeah, I think that's a very weird sort of thing to value, which might be why. Well, I like it. <laughs> Angie? Um, just a quick comment and a quick question. So the comment is, there are like people who want to argue that plants have experiences, right? So that they respond to the environment. So the two people I've got in mind, Matthew Hall and Michael Marder, might be worth looking up. So they argue that the that plants respond to the environment in a particular way, and they have some kind of experience of the world. So that was just a comment. Uh, the question, so I guess I'm just, just a little bit curious about whether this experiential diversity is something which tracks species or individuals, because it seems like individuals 
differ in their experiences. Right? We don't all have the same experience, even though we're part of the same species. So why is that not the difference? Well, yeah, I, I mentioned in the talk that that's probably more true for mentally complex species like humans. And I, and I think to an extent it's true for animals as well, but probably in a much more limited sense. So if we protect a species, it's like there's a certain structure of species, a certain structure of experience that goes between the member of that species potentially. And there's going to be some variations within that, but these are probably relatively minor. And if the, if the species continues, then those sort of fluctuations of individual experience will continue as well. I think that's incredibly contestable, but I'll leave that. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, it might not be <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you. I, thought, I think it's a really great project. Um, I agree with Angie about the species thing. I think you're putting an awful lot of weight on species here. And I'm not sure that the concept can, can kind of do the legwork that you wanted to do here. Um, that would be my kind of critique. I suppose my, my question is um, you said a lot about preserving a uh, variety of experience. We didn't say anything about creating <coughs> variety of experience. Does this give us a reason to create beings who have new kinds of experiences? I, I think if we value it, sure. And that, that was one of the objections that I cut, that it seems to imply that we should be creating new species. And maybe that's a bullet to bite. But I, I think some people might be reluctant to do, to do that because they might be afraid that it would go badly. We would create some sort of malformed species that would just suffer on that guy quickly. But if we got really good at it, and we, we saw that there's these experiential gaps in the world, and we could fill them with some crazy new species, I think, for sure, yeah, I think this would apply, but we do have a reason to do that. I like it. <laughs> well, I like the idea. Angela? Uh, I have the very same question about creating new species. Then I have... Yeah, so one quick yeah, follow up on that on that point is I mean one thing you might say in response to the create new species concern, I guess, if it's a concern, is that it, it seems to me, and I don't know if this literature that well, but it seems to me that a lot of views about the value of species or biodiversity have the implication that we ought to create create new species. Anyway, so it might just be a shared concern among a lot of views. So if I have in mind like Rousseau's account on which species are valuable because of their aesthetic properties for us. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. that's a helpful, hopefully that's going to be a helpful suggestion. Yeah, I, and I, if that makes sense, I, I think there does seem to be a sort of conservatism that's associated with conservationism and that help, at least I get the impression that a lot of them, they want to conserve species that already exist and don't care about creating new ones. Um, that, yeah, that's not what this idea would be arguing for, but some people might say that's what I'm presenting here, kind of takes it to a new direction, but, if, but that's interesting that, that it's already kind of associated with creative you know, And then I have a, oh, sure, yeah. a question. So um, when you're talking about painful experiences, the, yeah. the fish with the headache, yeah. right, you, you said, well, that, that would seem to show that variety it's the quality of the experience that matters, not the variety, right? And then you yeah. talked about what we would be required to do if all that matters is the right is the quality of experience, right? Yeah, and if we're maximizing, and if we're maximizing, right? Um, but you might think that. Uh, so I wonder if Brentano's principle of bonum variationis. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Would help you here, right? Which is that you know it's better to have a variety of a type of good than just one. Um, notice that it's bonum, right? It's not bad. So you might say um, variety increases value when we're talking about goods. It doesn't increase value when we're talking about bads. Right? right. So it, I mean, so that's that's a view that would avoid that kind of example. Um, and it might um, avoid the implication that we're obligated to maxima to produce species that have the optimal experience because there's this other value, mm -hmm. right? Um, variety of goods yeah. um, that's in play right. for species that have good lives, but we shouldn't create species that have bad lives simply because they'll increase right. that, that variety of, of experience. Yeah, and, um, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, and 
Yeah, sorry, that's basically the okay. suggestion. Yeah, that I, I haven't heard of that. That seems to fit with G.E. Moore's idea of ideal utilitarianism, kind of maximizing its variety of goods and not just pleasure. And, and yeah, I, I think I am relying on social value <coughs> pluralism as opposed to just valuing one thing and, and maximizing that. Um, if, if, if we did have to value just one thing and maximize that, I, I definitely wouldn't pick experiential variety. Right. Um, but I think as I want to plurality of values. Okay, great. Thank, thank you for that paper. I thought that was really interesting. Um, so you talked about a lot of different reasons why experiential variety might be valuable, uh, many of which were instrumental, and I think we can all agree that, that experiential variety has a lot of instrumental value, and for that reason alone, most of us in the room could probably endorse uh, uh, placing a high priority on preserving, or maybe even in some cases creating experiential variety. Um, but then, for me, the, the, the most philosophically interesting part is whether we should value experiential variety for its own sake, um, which also made up part, part of your talk and, and is really what I want to focus on. Um, so, so just to admit, um, I am inclined towards utilitarianism, and this is one of the issues that most concerns me about that inclination. This is maybe a repugnant conclusion of things that seem most intuitively implausible to me. But when I think about it, it does, at the end of the day, seem like a bullet that all things considered, it makes sense to bite when it comes to the intrinsic value of experiential variety. Um, and you can, you can modify examples like the one you and, and Duncan were talking about to kind of make that point. Forget about animals with bad lives. Imagine an animal with a good life. They have uh, two days that are pretty okay, and then a day with a migraine headache. And we do our creation ethics and our well-being ethics, and we determine that they have a life at least minimally worth living. We add more of them to the world. Those are good lives. But if there's a choice between creating a world with many such beings um, who, who have different types of headaches, but then two good days, and a different world where you can create fewer types of beings, none of whom have headaches. They never even interact. There are none of the instrumental benefits. Um, they're all on different planets. It just seems right that we should forget about experiential variety for its own sake, all things considered. What, what would you say about, say, like two different species who have structurally different sorts of experiences, but Hedonically, like pleasure-wise and pain-wise, they're the same. Would there be any reason to favor one? Like, would there be any reason to preserve both as opposed to one? Yeah, intuitively that seems right. Um, instrumentally, that also seems right, given how complicated the world is and how epistemically humble we should be about these issues in general. But theoretically, at the end of the day, I'm not sure. Yeah, and uh, like I'll, I'll admit, I, if, if someone if, if that's a bullet that you're willing to bite, I, I don't think there's much more that I can say. One of the things I was trying to get at with this paper is that I think a lot of environmental ethicists are tr like wanting to say something like this and like why they value biodiversity, and, and and I just hadn't really seen that being said, so it was kind of like just throwing that idea out there. Oh yeah, no, I think it, I think it's great. I I, I just. Um, I feel un uncertain whether I find the intrinsic value part persuasive, right. so I was interested in hearing yeah. anything more. Yeah, no, I, 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 don't, I don't understand that. Um, I'm, I'm actually on the fence. Mm -hmm. Myself. Great response on that question. What's the mother's testimony about the orange shirt? Like, yeah. um, thank you for this talk, it's really interesting. It, uh, it brought to mind a lot of my own sort of ruminations about where my where I stood in terms of the basis of value to my ecological thinking. Uh, we talked about two years ago, and it was about ecological loss and warning. All those questions of what is it we think we're going to lose, uh, given that there's so much climate change law field. So it's a warning in advance, what are we losing? So, what am I losing here? What's, what's, what's the thing that I'm probably have the most anxiety? And I came down to something like the closing off the possibility of interspecies we could learn from this people. And it's not 
It stands without any reference to according rights to animals, it stands without any reference to feeling like we have some duty in upholding the welfare of animals. It's this very selfish, thinking ape kind of thing, where I think one of the great limitations of philosophy is that it's largely, it's exclusively a human endeavor, and we might benefit from conversations with the minds. And we can't do that if we kill them all, or at least kill off their the environmental uh, basis of their life. And like, oh, we have whales, but they have little tanks, and they don't know anything about the whales before, so we have nothing to learn. And I think that is actually a strong possibility that we have with the technological development, such that there could be some sort of at least more assured inference about their natural experiences for you some kind of communication. And you were saying it's, it's like aesthetics, it's sort of aesthetics, I'm not sure. I think it's, it's an epistemic instrumentality, and that sort of epistemic achievement, if you want to put in the language, you could say it's the, the increasing self understanding of the world spirit, or whatever you want, know, whatever the discourse you want to put it in. But there is a sort of normative value that stands with aesthetics, that stands with ethics, that stands with theology, whatever, you know, whatever you think is really a standalone stand basis of normative value. I think epistemics continuing understanding, self-understanding, is something like one of those normative categories. And the loss experience when we have this destruction of a biological, uh, a neurodiversity and experiential diversity that grows out of bio, uh, biological being, that loss, I think, is of that type. It's that loss of uh, not just epistemic experiential beings that lost our possibility of self-understanding, thinking of itself through those encounters. And it can, I think, stand separately from any sort of life of concern, any sort of rights concern. But because those minds come out so, are so bound up in the life of the environment, it actually overlap, overlaps with some very stringent Ecosystem regulation uh, requirements. Because if you want to understand what it means to whale, if you want to understand what it means to you know about, if you really want to learn from these other kinds of experience and means, you probably need to preserve an awful lot of the natural environment to keep that cultural life flow intact. And so I think you have an overlap, a huge overlap of concern between people who say, I value, value their rights, I value their ecosystem that is natural climate it. And people say, I don't care about monkeys or whales or rates or well-being at all. But I want to talk to this thing and learn what it has to say about sentient people. Yeah, that's great. I just kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think I have anything to add to what you said. That I really like that. I, I think you were to do the same something that I was trying to, to get at to this paper. You were to do the same thing. Next person on the list, very you, but I wanted to ask, is there anyone else in that corner who had put up their arms? And please not hop in now. <laughs> okay, then. Thanks. Thanks for a really interesting paper. This was cool. Um, I have a question about the objection um, about focusing on the quality of experiences. And it, the way you responded to that objection was, well, if we focus on quality, we'll, we'll get to this mental monocropping um, and that will be a problem. And it seemed to me that, um, that the focus on the quality of experiences, you were sort of presupposing, I mean, I think in a lot of this, you have sort of a, co a consequentialist model in the background, um, where the way that we care about things like quality of experience is because we need to worry about what to preserve or what to bring into the world or take out of the world. Um, and I guess I had kind of more deontological or, I don't know, what, intuitions about why we would care about the quality of experiences. Um, so things like, look, all things equal, you shouldn't do things that diminish the quality of another creature's experience. Um, and it seemed like sort of my sense of why we should care about quality, why it's not just variety, but also whether the experiences are good or bad, um, comes out of concerns like that, that our sort of ethical relation to other creatures isn't just about bringing things into the world and taking them out. It's not just about sort of 
what different kinds of objects exist in the world, but it's about our responsibilities to, to other creatures who have in their lives. Um, so anyway, I thought I'd just see what you think about that. Sure, yeah, I, I, I think I was, I was assuming a consequentialist framework just because I was looking at someone who's objecting that we should only care about quality of their experiences, and that, that doesn't seem like a very deontological tap to take. Um, I guess maybe you could care only about quality of experiences, but take sort of the view that all of us people should not lower the quality of our own experiences. Um, you may think that the quality of experience makes certain moral claims on us or something. Right. Right. But presumably there would be other values that you might that you might have beyond just a hedonic quality, I would think. That's, but I, I guess you could have a hedonistic deontology. Um, I, ha I haven't considered what that would be like. But I, that's that's a good projection, and I think that should cause me to mitigate sort of, or at least sort of gesture at that possible possible view, because I was assuming it was Thanks. Yeah, so my uh, comment slash question is uh, somewhat uh, related to some earlier ones, um, but basically just asking why you so quickly concede that uh, experiential variety is just a human preference, just an anthropocentric kind of thing, when there are seem seemingly uh, so many options for ways to at least to attempt to ground it more objectively. Um, and maybe one kind of route would be <clears throat> to look to certain theorists of what makes uh, an individual sentient life valuable. And perhaps the, the one that comes to mind most readily is, is Martin Nussbaum, who talks about you know, 10 different aspects of well-being for humans and uh, not human animals, where these different goods are not substitutable, they're kind of complementary. And to me, that just entails immediately that, that there is value to Having a you know a variety of these goods that that uh, you know doesn't boil down to um, well it, it, ju it just it just uh, involves whether it's admitted or not some kind of an intrinsic value of a variety and and maybe another example would be uh, the Toronto philosopher Thomas Kirka who uh, has a recent book called um, the best things in life I think. And uh, he talks about you know the number of things that make um, human lives valuable, uh, three of which are knowledge, achievement, and love. And he says, well, you know, it's, it's conceivable that we could maximize one of these and then sacrifice the other two, mm -hmm. but it would actually be better to you know have a high level of achievement in say knowledge, but also have some amount of love in your life, some amount of um, you know making making a difference, etc. Um, so it seems to me, and you know, Brentano's uh, bonum very to note, but very often was another kind of um, route, I guess, to the to the same idea. But so since there are so many at least attempts to, to objectively ground the intrinsic value of variety, I'm, I'm just I guess I'm. It seems like you you conceded uh, that that it's just an anthropocentric preference, maybe a bit too hastily. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And one interesting way to maybe make this case would be um, coming out of like, sort of disability ethics mm -hmm. and just the the value of different sort of ways of thinking of being as a human, and then saying, okay, well, we value experiential variety here, and now we can extend this to non-human animals as well. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's I think that's a good point. I um, yeah, no, that's, that's useful, thanks. Tiana, on this side. Yeah, thanks, um, it was very inspiring. I feel like I have to think more about it before I can even ask the question. Uh, perhaps uh, one thing that you would need to think about is um, about trade-offs between quality and quality of experiences. If we could like improve the quality of experience at the cost of Less variety, <coughs> yeah. so we would ultimately would want to go on, need some story about how to deal with these trade offs. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really interesting. I, I think that would be especially tricky if we had, if we are already at sort of like a life worth living level, mm -hmm. and we could either make it add, like, add more pleasure or add more variety. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, 
maybe I would. I, I, I think I could see adding more variety as opposed to more pleasure at a certain, like if you're already at some sort of like some level of an enjoyable life, mm -hmm. potentially. Um, but I'm not sure, that, and that, that is a, a good thing to think about that. Uh, yeah, that's a good way to separate like really good intuitions about diversity. Thanks. Um, I have a question. Um, so we talked about the question of like what is creating new um, Brian's experience got me thinking, and uh, at the beginning of the talk, you talked about okay, why should we care about or why should we value experiential variety? And you talked about empathy, and I wonder whether that could be a factor distinguishing um, valuing experiential variety that is there or that is developing through biodiversification that's not our, you know, direct. Um, or not, at least not our, our intention, versus being in the lab and creating experiential varieties. There's, to me, there's no empathy there in that in that creation, versus you know valuing. I mean, do you, does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's that does make sense. And so, I, I guess the empathy empathy was something that I saw as being a sort of instrumental value. Of, uh, value in experiential diversity. And you're right, it doesn't, it's, it's really hard to see how that would apply to creating new sorts of experiences. I mean, you would, it would have to be some sort of forward-looking, imaginative empathy, but... It's to me, like, the valuing of the experiential variety that is there or that is becoming, to me, that's much more non anthropocentric than desire to go in the lab, but I, I, don't, I don't know how to frame it, but it seems to me intuitively that there's a distinction there uh, between you know, yeah. crafting species so that we can check out this mm -hmm. new experiential variety that we're creating. But maybe I'm that, that makes sense to me because existing animals, we can have some sort of relationship with them and a curiosity about, them, about how they see the world as opposed to just, you're right, it's just like, if you're creating new species, it's like Alice. I mean, it, it, I guess it depends how, what brought you to valuing experiential diversity. It, it might, so it might be about wanting to think about this cool new way of experiencing, but there might be more to that if we're valuing it independently for other reasons. Um, so, yeah, I don't, but I, I think that's, that's a good point. Yeah, we just had a finger on that. I was wondering how you would respond to the extinction that experience you still that. Yeah, like, that's interesting. It's sort of a middle ground between already existing species and creating new species. Could we have empathy with an extinct species? I, I don't know. I feel like we could have empathy for like the dodo. And, I don't, people do seem to feel sad about the dodo going extinct and there's like images of them and there's ammonia. One of them at the Natural History Museum in the UK. Um, I, yeah, I, I like that question. It's I. I think it's a little more. That brings us a little more closer to the empathetic uh, experience. But I, I guess it would be similar to having an empathetic experience with an animal from a species, an animal that you never encounter but does exist and you know exists and you're thinking about it. Um, I feel like in principle you could do that as well or almost as well with an extinct species. Maybe not as well with a species that hasn't yet existed. I don't know. That's, that's a good question. Thanks. More questions? Yep. <laughs> Sorry again. Uh, my question is a bit, uh, my thoughts are all over the place now. Uh, I'm way symp more sympathetic to the idea that what is tragic about the extension of specific group is not like biodiversity uh, or genetic diversity, but the loss of the way to of experiencing uh, the world. I, I'm sympathetic at, the, at first with this idea. Uh, I think that, like in, in uh, we value cultural diversity and languages in the human case. And even, I don't think that in political philosophy anyone agrees if we value it, cultural diversity and languages for, the, for their own, its own sake or in an instrumental way. Right. And I'm 
quite sure we can move forward in political philosophy without having settled it, this question. And I think that it's possible also uh, in, in the case, in, in your case, in the case of animals. But uh, I, I completely agree with M.G. Pepper when she said that this will not necessarily bring us to uh, preserve species. Because I, I think that the, the lived experience of a home cat or a home dog, a companion dog and a companion cat, is much more similar than like a, a wild cat. Mm. And I don't think it's the species that will preserve in that, in, that, uh, in that specific sense. And you said that we should not, I really loved it when you said that we should not be maximizing experiential vi uh, diversity and variety because it, obviously we do really weird places. But uh, you, maybe I did not get exactly what you were saying, but you then went to talk about uh, increasing the, the kind of, you made the distinction between simple mind types and complex mind types. And I was wondering, maybe I just didn't get what you were going, uh, where you were going with that, but would you apply that to the human case and value more human beings with like a more complex experience of the world and value less? Because you talked about disability, disability literature earlier in the yeah. question period. So I think you are quite sensitive to the problem here. Yeah. Um, no, I, I didn't mean to say valuing them more or less. The, the point was more getting at the wild suffering uh, conundrum, which is that wild animals can't devise solutions to the problem that some people see of living in the wild, of you know, being attacked by predators, living in fear, uh, doing <coughs> starvation, and, and so on. Whereas um, humans living in society can have a variety of mental complexity, and as long as there are people helping, him, helping them, that's fine. And, and we can help animals to an extent, but the worry is that we can't help all the animals who would need it. Uh, so it's not varied, it's not complexity, it's autonomy. If you, it's independence, autonomy, it's not variety or complexity that they're talking about. Yeah, but wild animals are autonomous, they're just, they don't have the mental capacities and I guess like the bodily structure to be able to create I guess a civilization or whatever like solutions to their problems, whereas humans do. And so I was I was imagining a world where if we're trying to maximize uh, positive sensations, and we think that animals are are good for that because actually simple minds experience joy more potently and that kind of thing. Uh, the problem is that they would also need a lot of help to avoid problems like getting diseases and so on. And I think. A caring human community can take care of other humans who, who need it. Uh, it's, it's just a lot more difficult when we're, and it's this thought experiment, imagining not too many humans and a lot of animals who potentially need help. But, the, I, but yeah, that's, that's a good thing to, to bring up because it was, uh, uh, I, I wasn't, I'm, I'm very, I'm kind of suspicious of the, the higher pleasures idea. I'm sympathetic with the idea that mental complexity in itself is, is not better than having a, a simpler cognition. Um, it's just instrumentally it's better for devising solutions to problems. Or creating. Or creating problems, problems. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We can also see it completely the other way around. We could, right. we could look at the world and then see animals as being quite able to live within their ecological means, where we see human beings as unable to do that, right. and as creating a lot of problems. So you could reverse the problem. You could see it the other way. Yeah, you could. I mean, you could say, well, animals aren't going to be able to come up with medicines and so on, but you know, they're not with any guns and bombs. And, and, and yeah. so yeah, they're not creating yeah. all these problems for others. So yeah, I, I, I was kind of influenced here by this guy, David Pierce, who <laughs> uh, so like transhumanism, the idea is that we shouldn't be looking at how humans are now, but like in the future, it looks like com complex minds are going to be better for like devising solutions to these problems that we, we still clearly have. And that may or may not be true, but uh, like Pierce, for instance, is very worried about human extinction. And one of the reasons is he doesn't want animals left on their own, because even though humans are very harmful to animals now, if humans have the right sort of ideology and technology, 
it would be better for animals if, if humans were here. And so we can imagine. But no, if they were here, but were not humans, <laughs> really humans as we know them, would be yeah, very I mean, different humans. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just a quick, quick, quick remark. Sorry. Oh. Uh, I heard a talk pretty similar to yours by completely different guys called uh, Brett Buchanan. He's a Canadian scholar working at Laurentian University. What's and doing, doing uh, Brett Buchanan. Okay. He's doing stuff on uh, phenom phenomenological exploration of extension, of species extension. And he has all okay. these, like, so he had the same premise as you, but okay. not the same type of conclusion, but the same kind of like thought experiments and seeing, uh, see, trying to figure out what kind of loss we there is in the extinction of the next experimental uh, species. Okay. What What was his conclusion? What sort of conclusion? Uh, uh, I mean, mostly descriptive <laughs> ethics, not so much normative <laughs> ethics. I'm not sure where he's going with the what we should do, but it's okay. mostly a description of what we feel when you see a sentient uh, species extinct. Okay. <laughs> uh, forgive me if you didn't, if you covered this already, as there's so many ideas out there, but could we argue for the value of experiential variety from a purely blatantly anthropocentric standpoint to say that when we preserve the experiential variety of other species, then that ensures that our own experiential variety, our own experience of being human will be will be better preserved in the sense that, um, like what you were mentioning with the de-extinctification project, like there's this project in Siberia right now called the Pleistocene Park, where they're trying to rebreed woolly mammoths, because apparently when we hunted them to extinction, there was a lot of negative harmful ecological impacts. If we bring them back, then it might slow down global warming, things like that, so that by sort of valuing, empathizing, with the, with the mammoth experience, then we bring it back, and then in turn, we enhance or at least make a make a, a, a greater chance that our own experience will be preserved. I mean, I know that's just like, we should we should preserve them so that we have a better chance, but hey, why not? Yeah, I mean, that would be a very <coughs> instrumental way of looking at it, but that potentially, it could work to get people more interested in um, helping more animals, which would lead to being better to the environment and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I mean, it would sort of reflect the fact that we are interconnected with other species, and that you right. can't just look at one any species in isolation. Right. That we're we're all stronger off when there's more different types of experiences that maybe we don't even understand how they fit in. Right. But yeah. I mean, one thing about experiences is that it's difficult to test them. I think. Um, but but we can we can think about them and um, and yeah that if, if that increases our interest in animals that that would be better for us probably. Thanks. Okay, if, if, if there's time, I'm I'm now curious. Um, so so one thing that people are discussing a lot in connection with uh, advances in AI are um, the possibility of creating virtual worlds with uh, sentient inhabitants. Because if and when we can create virtual worlds with sentient inhabitants, which may well be a decade or two or three away, then um, there will be a lot more potential to create quintillions of, of beings who can have the experiences that we program them to have. Uh, and we can be gods in whole new worlds. And then that raises lots of creation ethics questions. Yeah. So I guess my question is, do you think that your, roughly speaking, arguments in favor of experiential variety in the real world would carry over to virtual worlds in that kind of situation? Yeah, I think, I think so. I, I, don't, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. Because, I mean, in a way, if, if we're trying to help certain species survive or try to help certain species go extinct, that's that's a sort of creation uh, in itself. So the simulation makes it more direct and obvious, but I think in this world it would be the same. So then that would then place a lot of pressure on whether you want to be making a distinction between creation and preservation, because this would be more exclusively a case of creation. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah it would lose the, you know, the, you know, the aspect of well, maybe not, but, um, but but it wouldn't require taking a stance about 
the ethics of creating new beings as opposed to preserving currently existing beings or things. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. So if there's an argument against creating new species that is somehow consistent with not only expansion learning, then that would also apply to the simulation. I have one more question by Mike. Well, just, just a short comment on that. I'm doubtful of the instrumental value from this perspective, so sort of better understanding cognition and the physical issue generally, of what we can learn from self created worlds, just because it assumes we, we understand enough to model something. I mean, we, there might be emergent characteristics that come out of it, but I just think. We understand so little about the I have general anxiety about the virtual replacing the actual, but we still understand so little. But I also wonder how much we could be surprised by the varieties of experience that come out of the human design. Although we don't understand a lot of stuff about the virtual too. So. Yeah, I, I mean, the simulation <laughs> argument that that comes from was assuming that the people creating these simulations are doing it to learn. Uh, they're creating ancestor simulations to see how people like their ancestors live, but they could also be doing it to see how beings like the beings they're creating could think. And, and so, yeah, this is treated as more of a learning experience as a So I assume, so I think there's emergent stuff being assumed there as opposed to we already know everything and we're just going to create a simulation. So a lot of the stuff might be happening after the singularity when the supercomputers are doing it. Right. Yes. Yeah. One thing we've got is that we've got the distinction between creation and preservation. Maybe that at some point we discover that they are already. Mm -hmm. So it's not all creating. It's not about creating. It's about we already have them. I mean, the main concern there is whether their life or their existence is not possible because they are suffering they pass you away their well-being, so then this wouldn't apply. But what happens if we discover that they exist already and maybe their existence is very like, positive. So then the argument clearly applies even if you strengthen that distinction right between creation and preservation. I, I didn't I didn't make out all that. Are you talking about you're saying computers might already be sentient or uh, not computers. There will be like softwares or yeah. and given the problem of other minds we can never know for sure. Yeah. Um, some sort of algorithms, right. whatever. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's someone who argues that video game characters might be suffering, and so we shouldn't play video games where people are being killed. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. Oh, I yeah, I think time is up. The organizer wants to say something about uh, dinner. Uh, yeah, the, the, the but, uh, thank you for, for the talk. Yeah. <laughs>